In your practice profile, you want to show that uh, what you'll be like to work with, that your potential client will like you, will trust you, and that you will understand what they want out of their projects. Business of Architecture UK, episode 31. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. My name is Ryan Willard and I'm your host. And today I had the pleasure of sitting in my office and speaking with Juliet Mitchell, who is the founder of Archetypal, which is a writing consultancy specifically for architects. Now this was a fascinating discovery for me to find that there is somebody specializing in this and also quite unique because you know, for me, I really do think that architecture is conversation and that the words that we use to describe and talk about architecture are so important and often we negate them. And Juliet has had an, uh, you know, a fascinating career. She's worked at Penguin Books, she's worked in publishing, um, and now she's developed her expertise specifically to help architects identify their key messages. She's excellent at working with architects to use words to create narratives uh, that can draw in their clients and helping architects to use words that make a real impact where it matters. So there's a lot of information here in this uh, podcast. So sit back and enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm Ryan Willard and today I'm speaking with Juliet Mitchell, who is the founder of Archetypal, which is an organization, a company that helps architects with their writing for bids, competition proposals, their websites, um, newsletters, and for general for their, for their Anything marketing. Anything they have to write. Excellent. And so how, this is, this is quite a unique service that you're offering. How did this come about? I used to work in publishing. I worked for Penguin Books for 11 years and then I worked as a um, self-employed as an editor and I loved working with writers. Uh, I loved, you know, I loved editing and I loved everything that goes with the publishing process. But I started to feel that uh, I needed to get out into the real world and work with people who actually had a specific purpose in writing, who were uh, not writers, didn't want to be writers, mm. but had to write things because I feel that we all have to write things in our jobs, or almost all of us. And it's, you know, writing is one of the most important things. Communication is yeah. one of the most important things. It can change people's minds. It can make things happen. Um, it's... Uh, it can be the difference between getting a client and not getting a mm. client, keeping a client, not keeping the client. Uh, and I felt like uh, in architecture, which is, uh, you could say, a predominantly visual medium, yes. um, it's full of people who feel very comfortable uh, sketching, drawing, designing, but are not so comfortable with words. Mm. And once I started to think about working uh, not with writers, but people who just had happened to have to write things. Um, I started to think about architecture because I'd always been uh, very interested in architecture and was becoming more so. Uh, and I realised that you go onto a lot of architects' websites and they have beautiful images and it's all very inspiring. And then you look at the text and the text is lagging maybe 20 years behind. It's stayed, it's unimaginative. Uh, it doesn't quite know what it's doing mm. and it doesn't know how to um, speak about all that creativity. Um, so so what, what are the kind of major mistakes that you often see with architects in their writing, let's say on a website, for example? Uh, I think being generic is one of the big mistakes. Um, okay. I think, you know, words like award-winning and multidisciplinary if there's nothing to explain about you know this award we won and what it was and why we won it then award-winning means very little uh, multidisciplinary is the same it's uh, well it's a word that's trying to talk to everybody mm. but actually is ending up talking to no one yeah i suppose this is one of these kind of classic uh, things that we see when architects operating in their marketing is you know we love pictures of gutter details we love the yeah. kind of yeah. almost you know to the point of abstraction and yeah. so sometimes yeah. you know and there's often a dictum that kind of underlies you know we want to let the work speak for itself but obviously yes. that's a bit of a fallacy yes and uh i think there's a you know there's a big gap between an architect and a potential client 
or even a client who they're working with about how the client or potential client understands things and uh, I think you know architects have to think about how they bridge that gap how they bridge the gap between their own vision of what their building is and the vision for the client um, it's about you know for it's that usual thing of turning features into benefits that mm. a feature like a gutter for an architect you know the the client has to understand what that's why that's going to make their life better so what's the process that you all go through with an architect who, and how would an architect even recognize that, they've, that there's something wrong with their, uh, with their writing in their, yeah, in their marketing okay. output, um, for example? I think uh, um, some architects, in fact, not just architects, but people generally, whenever they go onto their website, they have a slightly, they cringe slightly. They don't quite feel it represents them. Mm. So I think that's the first step to thinking, why am I hesitating about going onto my own website. It should be my shop front that I'm proud of. But actually these, as shop fronts, often they are kind of, uh, uh, yeah, architects realise that they're not quite speaking properly about mm. what the architect is doing and the wonderful buildings that the architect is designing. Um, so I think that's a first sign that, you know, it's time to actually address this and work out what's wrong. So how would you, yeah, can I say, you're just talking about the process that you go through yeah, oh with, yes, with, that's right. with architects. Um, how, so how they would establish their... Uh, there's something not oh, yes. quite right. Okay, so I think um, I think it's also if, if you if as an architect you find it difficult to write about what you do, um, if you find it slightly stressful, if you're daunted by the blank page, if there's all sorts of negative feelings around it, then I think it's time to do something. Mm. Um, I work with architects in three, yeah, basically three different ways. Um, one is to actually um, do the writing for the client, for the architect. Um, so they're you know, we would, I would um, meet them. I love going to architects' offices because I think if I go to someone's office, I can very quickly just get a sense of who they are and what they do and what they're inspired by, mm. what their purpose is, purpose being that all-important word, um, and, you know, what they aspire to, where, what, where they're trying to go with their practice. So that's, a, for me, a really good step. And immediately I can feel the difference between that, you know, between sitting in someone's office and how I feel about what they do and then going onto their website and seeing these rather right. okay. so awkward a, words that are not quite describing it. So it, for me, it's a sort of shortcut to understanding got it. a lot about who they are and what they do. Got it. So uh, and then it's obviously the conversation I have with them. Right. So there's also like a kind of, um, if architects are knowing how to communicate their own values, their own, you know, their own kind of mission, Yes. That will come out in their writing, but they need to have done that kind of work first. Um, yeah, so I, I think at that point, um, so it should come out in their writing. I think the, the first thing I would do is have that conversation where I try and find out as much as possible about, you know, why they do what they do and how they work and who their perfect clients are. Um, I off, after that meeting, I often send questions because for me, I can, you know, I'll, I'll make a list of questions that I will then let them answer in their own time, not labouring over it. The idea is just to get stuff down on So what kind, of, what kind of questions do you ask? Uh, questions about, uh, for example, you know, when you first, if it's someone who started their own practice, when you first started your practice, um, was there anything that you, um, you know, that you had in your mind as to what your practice would be that has now fallen by the wayside or been forgotten? Um, Interesting. You know, why, why do you find that's a good question? Um, because I think when people start out, they often have a, a wonderful and very clear idea of what they want to be doing as an architect. We know it might be why they've left a big practice and decided to set up mm. on their own, um, what they found clumsy about that big practice and what they now know they can change by mm. working on their own. But five years down the line, they are so busy just running their practice that they've uh, forgotten to um, forgotten what that was even. They've lost their perspective. Um, they're too busy in the, the daily grind of, uh, of working. Um, so a lot of what I'm doing is before the actual writing stage, just getting them to come back to what it's all about, uh, right. which is actually a really satisfying thing for me, I think, as well as for them to yeah. just see them uh, remembering. It's like a kind um, of therapeutic. It is quite a therapeutic thing. Yeah. You know, I, um, I wouldn't go so far as how I'm a counsellor <laughs> or anything, but yeah, we can get um, uh, quite far into sort of just remembering those important things which differentiate them. Mm. Um, so it's a good process. And, and how is that conducted? How do you how do you do that kind of work? 
Um, so that I do over email. So I'll send them the questions because I think that's quite good for them to just jot down their answers without me mm. um, looking over their shoulder. And then they'll bat it back to me with their answers. And um, I will then get going on working out what they want to say. Um, mm. I tend to go a little bit slowly and that I might then get in touch with them with an idea of this, these are the things that I feel are important. And then once they say, yes, that's it, you've got it, then I will put that into a, um, you know, into long sentences, and right. into text. And then obviously often at that stage, there'll still be some tweaking and some going backwards and forwards and making sure that it's absolutely how it should be. Saying that, I think a website is always a work in progress. So it doesn't work to think, right, whew, we've done that, put it on the website, forget about it for the next 10 years. Yeah. I think it should always be revisited um, by, you know, if it's your practice, your website, keep going back to it, keep thinking, oh, maybe I should add a bit here, take this away, uh, put in a bit of detail here. Because I think that's, you know, if you go to a website and, you, and uh, somehow you can tell when something's been abandoned, uh, yes. you know, it starts to just feel a bit old. Yeah, date, um, has that dated feel to it, that unloved. Feel, exactly, unloved, yes. Yeah. And, and so um, how do you, so once you've got this kind of the vision statement or you've kind of got architects reconnected with their purpose yeah. for running a practice, it's quite, you know, that kind of inspirational work, the important mission value driven stuff. How do you go about then translating that into something which is palatable, digestible and emotively interesting to the potential client because often I would imagine that's an area where lots of people kind of get stuck is that we architects yes, are very good at talking yeah, about yeah. architecture to yeah. other architects yeah. to other architects yeah. well I think that's the point of me really is that I'm not an architect my background is um, editing it's publishing it's books it's words um, and it's not architecture so I come at it as a potential client really right. or, um, and I can see things immediately that don't work for a normal person uh, so, you know, some people come to me and say, but how can you do this? You're not an architect. And I say, yeah, that's absolutely the point is that I don't, I haven't sat in uh, architecture lectures for seven years and I haven't absorbed all that stuff. So I can spot, you know, I can spot jargon at however many paces I, I kind of, I feel I know what works. Mm. Um, what, what do you consider as jargon? Um, uh, things like, um, you know, the words mass and long plan and... <laughs> and uh, uh, loading and all, you know, oh, I, I try and get keep my head free of jargon, so there's not much in there, but yeah, I can spot it straight away. I, I always find that as an interesting question to, to understand what is considered jargon and what's not, because yeah, obviously yeah. in for an architect, these words become kind of common parlance. Yes. And you're yeah. using them with your interactions yeah. with people. And I, yeah. you know, I know from my experience, talking with clients, there's been a, a, a learning curve where I've gone through where I'm talking about architectural concepts yeah. and then there's a blank stare on somebody's yes. face and you're yes. like, okay, that's yeah. clearly not yeah. landing. Yeah, no. And there's also, you know, things which probably are not just architecture, but lots of different industries. If you start talking about oh, every building we, we design is um, aiming at exceeding best practice you know what does best practice mean actually talk about pulling out all the stops to make this a building that people will want to live in or whatever it's uh, you know it's bringing in the human element mm. um, now I do a lot of um, work through workshops as well so um, just to quickly explain so I do that kind of work as we've talked about where I'm actually doing the writing um, then I do uh, I work with architects when they've written something and they want a fresh eye and so we work together on something and that's actually very satisfying because it's come from them which yeah. I like very much and then I'm there to kind of yeah the translation service to, yeah exactly yeah. Um, to bridge that gap to the real world um, and then the third thing I do is run workshops um, I run workshops for the Museum of Architecture um, I've done an interactive session for the RIBA mm. and I do in-house workshops and uh, the point there is to um, to get people really finding a new approach. Um, and one of the things that's important and kind of will help architects do that without me doing it for them is to remember that they need to be talking to someone. Mm. So when they are writing their practice profile, don't look at the blank page and, you know, feel stumped or stymied. 
think about who you are writing for. Mm. You know, just think about your perfect client. Think about one person and write to them. And I think, um, I think that's something that when we're talking, you know, we're talking to someone, even sitting here with you, you know, I'm looking at you, I'm talking to you. Mm. And that means that I know, you know, I'm, you're actively listening to me, you're nodding, that keeps me going. Yeah. Um, when you're staring at a blank page or a blank screen, we don't have that. Got it. And so what I try and get people to do, and it works, uh, is um, find a way of tricking their brain into feeling that they're writing for, for someone, for right. that perfect client. And then suddenly they, what they write becomes more human, uh, they sound more approachable, they become more specific because they're thinking about what that imaginary potential client is interested in, um, and it all starts fitting into place. So is it just like a kind of a, visualis- a visualization? A visualization, yeah, yeah. Right. So there's one thing that we um, that I do in my workshops, which is uh, I get some I get people to do what can be quite an excruciating exercise, but it's absolutely worth doing. Which is they start off. Um, I tell them to face the wall, and so everyone's facing the wall and feeling slightly awkward, and then they have one minute to talk about their practice facing the wall, and they have to keep talking for that one minute, <laughs> and it's one of the hardest things because you are talking into space. But that's why writing can feel very hard because you're you're writing into a blank space. Right. So after we've done that, it's over. You know, they're delighted that their one minute is over. They all found it really hard. They're then in pairs talking to each other, and suddenly they understand how much easier it is when you're talking to another person. Yes. And you know that person is encouraging you, listening, showing interest, and the words flow. Right. So. And that's that's really interesting, actually, because I can imagine that that gives a very different tone and quality to the writing that's produced when you're thinking about it conversationally. Yes. Rather than doing something which is, you know, just going out to a a general populace for everyone to see. Yeah. yeah, There's a lot of kind of anxiety wrapped up in producing something like that and it's got to be perfect and um to give you an example of that um i was working on a um a piece of writing about a project and i was looking at this um this little piece of writing and it was uh very uh felt very unnatural there was a lot of passive so um you know uh the building was built to rather than we built uh, which is active uh everything was just very dull and can you, just same, go, can you just go into that a little bit more detail, the passive and active? Oh, the passive. So um, if I say to you, um, 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 I sat on the mat rather than, so mm. that is, I sat on the mat, that's me, that's I'm active, I'm doing the sitting on the mat. If I say the mat was sat on by me, that's passive. I see. And for some reason, <laughs> architects decide that passive is the way to go right that it kind of maybe makes it more professional or more serious adds gravitas but actually all it does is take away from any kind of personal element um it makes it sound very um oh, very dull and abstract it makes, almost. abstract as if the architect had no real um investment in yeah like a, no, like a report like a report absolutely like yeah. here's here's what happened uh, here's, yeah rather yeah. than yeah. you know I'm, I, we I am doing this. I design this. This comes from my head. This is mm. what I wanted to do. So it's very different. So I was reading this, um, this passage that this uh, person had written. And at the same time, they were in the, in the same office and I could hear them on the phone talking about this same project. And they were talking about it full of enthusiasm. Uh, it sounded great, the way they were talking about it. And then I looked back at what I was reading, realising it was the same project. There was no <laughs> comparison. So when they came off the phone, that was it. I said, I heard you talking about that. You love that project. You're, you know, you're totally invested in it. And this is what you've written. It's Mm. completely different. So what that voice that he had when he was talking about it, that's what you need to get onto the page. Right. And that that natural, authentic. Natural, authentic. That actually uh, speaks to the emotions of the the reader. Yeah. So is this, what you do, is this different from, say, like copy writing or sales copy? Well, so in a, is there an overlap? There is definitely an overlap. Um, So I don't call myself a copywriter because I feel there's a lot more to what I do. And I do a lot of the, um, you know, I'm very into, um, in, 
getting architects to do the writing for themselves. So, right. I'm, you know, I, that's why I do the workshops. I'm not at all precious about, oh, this is my skill. I want to hang on to it. I feel like there are some very easy ways for architects to change their approach and to learn better ways of talking about what they do. And, I mean, it's like that Chinese proverb about, um, you know, teaching someone to fish rather than giving them fish. Yes. Um, I feel that's the way forward. Yeah. Um, which is why I love doing workshops because I feel they, you know, architects can come out at the end of it thinking, oh, yes, I can design buildings um, and I can write about them. Mm. And I think also it's if you can write about your building, uh, you you think better about it and you then, you know, it can lead you to being a better designer. Mm. I think it's a bit like, um, you know, think back to school days when you had, uh, had to actually write an essay. It forces you to think and to articulate what you're thinking. If you don't have that task of writing an essay, it just stays swirling around in your mind. Yeah. But actually having to articulate it and put it on. Uh, put pen to paper means that you know we we actually have to choose the we have to find how we're getting at something how the way into a subject mm. and I think for architects it can really help them um, yeah think properly about what what they're building it is yeah and clarify um, clarify what it means to the client uh, what they're doing with the, the building how it's um, you know how their purpose has being translated into that building so mm. it's for them it, you know it should writing about their project should bring all that to mind well, it's, it's very um, interesting because at school there's often a kind of aversion sometimes to you know or, or the sort of let the work speak for itself kind of oh, mind, yes. mindset yes. and actually yeah. all drawings all buildings are they, they need that kind of conversation to activate them they, yes a, a, a drawing yes. A drawing can become alive yes when yeah. somebody is describing it and explaining it yeah um, so an, an interesting thing on that is that um a lot of architects um will when they have to write about the projects they start with their the images and the floor plans so they'll mm. have their images in front of them i think right now i've got to write my 200 words about this and they'll start you know looking at the photographs and describing the project but what you actually should do, I think, is put away all your props, all your images and your floor plans, and delve into your head instead. And that is how you will bring up the, the story of the project. Mm. Uh, you know, that's what will remind, that's when you'll think about what is actually, what inspired you about this design. Um, you'll think about the effect of the design rather than just the design itself, you know, not what the design is, but what it does and what it means to people who are going to live in it or work in it. Mm. Um, and it, um, you know, it becomes much more interesting. Alive. For, alive for the reader. Um, so, you know, the way I, in my workshops, the way I get architects to approach their uh, project is you ditch all the props, Right. You know, you're freeing up your head to actually think about what a building means and then think about one thing uh, or think about what inspired you at the very start when you started thinking about this project, the design, something that challenged you along the way and then something that you really like about it now. And once you've got those three things, you've got a beginning, you've got a middle and an end. And when you've got a beginning, a middle and an end, you've got a story. Yes. And obviously, you know, stories make it far easier for you because they're like the scaffolding that you can hang your project on. It's easy to remember. Easy to remember and far more meaningful for the reader. Because in the end, all your readers are humans. Mm. And as humans, we understand stories. We, you know, everything slots into place if it's part of a story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what you write can still be professional. It can still be sophisticated. But... It'll have a, you know, it'll work for the reader um, and it'll be more human. So, so where do you think are the most important places for architects to really get this art of storytelling down? Uh, I think in their projects, actually. I think um, for uh, a practice profile, the most important thing is the human side. I think of a practice profile as... as a way to show people that um, what you will be like to work with, you know, you've got to 
um, especially for small practice. I work a lot with small practices. I like yeah. small practices, but I also like big practices. But think about small practices that's very satisfying because it's, it's um, you know, they're obviously people. They're passionate. Uh, they're they're very passionate about what they do. So, um, you know, in your practice profile, you want to show that um, uh, what you'll be like to work with, that your potential client will like you, will trust you, and that you will understand what they want out of their project. So it's... Um, uh, it's translating what you do into what they want, right. which again comes back to the features that's sort of being translated into benefits. So that's about the, the human side, who you are. Then I think of projects as um, as the stories. So you know, you're, uh, there are a lot of architects' websites where there are loads of projects and and there are loads of quite technical little descriptions mm. and uh, or even quite long descriptions under each set of images and. You know, I really wonder how many people will go through and read all of those. You know, they might look at the images because the images are beautiful. Yeah. But actually, the text adds very little. But if you can tell a lovely little story, um, you know, with each project, um, then it works beautifully. And the images, which I've said, you know, start ditch your, ditch your props, ditch your images. Then at the point when you've written your story about the project, find the images that... Uh, that explain that story, that kind of bring life to your Got story. It. And so what um, kind of, you've kind of touched on it a bit already, but what are the sort of really compelling elements of a story? So, ra- you know, rather than describing, you know, the, uh, the, the technical details of a particular junction in a building, yeah. is it more focusing on like the human activity uh, that's going it's on? Focusing or? on, yes, what it'll mean to the people who will live or work in it. Um, it can be, you know, the story of your building could be, you know, where the, you know, how you were inspired to build it because you could see how, um, you know, how a space uh, or how, uh, you know, if you were responding to a site, maybe the constraints for site, how you then overcame the, those constraints and how now the finished building, how you see your, you know, the clients living in the building Got it. and how it works for them. Got it. So that's all very human. That's coming from, you know, how you responded to the site yeah. and how you enjoyed the challenge of responding to the site mm. and how, you know, your response now works for people in it. This is absolutely not rocket science. What I love about what I do is that it is not rocket science. I'm all about trying to, you know, demystify, bring, demystify it all. This is just about writing things that people relate to. I mean, you can still, you know, capture the complexity, the beauty, the subtlety of everything you do, but you mm. can do it clearly in simple language and in a way that people relate to. And so do you, and so do you think, so I'm just imagining an architect listening to this right now and perhaps they're recognizing, you know, I've got a lot of beautiful images on my websites. I don't have much uh, writing about it and I kind of want to keep it paired back. Yeah. How, how could they start to re-evaluate uh, well, I'm all for paired back. So I'm a words person, but I like few words. Okay. So that's all good if it's paired back. But I think it's just if they've got two lines describing the square footage and, um, uh, you know, the technical details about materials. I mean, materials are lovely and that's all fine, but it's dependent on how you talk about it. Um, but I think it, so if you've just got those two lines, which are very technical, I think it's turning it into a... Um, a couple of lines, or maybe a few more than a couple, but mm. which is all about, um, which just shows the intention behind the building, the purpose behind the building. Um, and just also brings out the the same voice that was in the practice profile. So, you know, if you've managed to capture yourself in the practice profile, make sure that your projects are carrying on that same voice and that same message and that same inspiration and purpose and yeah. inspiration so it's aligned it's a li- it's aligned it's all got to be aligned and i suppose this this can carry on for things i can see this being very powerful in things like competitions yes and I've absolutely worked on competitions yes. before and i've seen yeah. the hours of head oh. scratching that yeah. architects go through yeah. and it can be for a very small piece of text yeah yeah so uh, i think um you know it's very easy to spend far too long writing um, well, I can when I work with an architect on an award submission, um, you know, they'll send me something often that they've written and that they've kind of got stuck with. And you know, what I do is quickly see 
what's important, mm. what the judges actually want to know. So a good way for an architect to do this themselves is, um, you know, if they've, if you've got an, a, um, if you're doing an award submission, you've got the criteria, translate those criteria into questions. Um, so, for example, uh, if the um, if it's about sustainability, uh, and that's what you've got to cover in this part, you know, turn that into a question about what have I done to make this building uh, use less energy and tread lightly on the earth, whatever, however you mm. phrase your question, but turn it into a question that you can then answer in a natural way. Right. And you'll find it much easier rather than kind of trying to tick these rather abstract boxes. I see, yes. Yeah. I, mean, um, I uh, think on that subject of questions, um, uh, bios, as in, you know, the little notes on a website that architects write about themselves, uh, I think they're notoriously difficult to do because writing about oneself is really difficult, especially if you then turn it into the third person, as in she, da 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 um, and they sound very dull because by the time you've put all the acronyms for all the qualifications, you've well, lost well, everybody. Yeah, and this is, this is one of the things I know, you know, I, I see it, I've done this before myself, you know, writing the third person about Ryan Willard, did yeah, this and this yeah. and this. And it's, well, it's obvious that it's me writing it or half the time. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I think it's very difficult to make those natural. Um, now, the, a very traditional way of doing it, which I think a lot of architects and other people still do, is you start with your qualifications and then you talk about where you've worked, so your experience, and then you might finish with your um, professional skills and interests. But actually, if you turn that on its head, start with the, what you're actually interested in. So, for example, social housing and making, you know, engaging communities to come up with better buildings. Mm. Um, start with that's, you know, what you're interested in. Then you've, hooked, you've got people's interest with that because that's actually what's interesting about you as an architect. I'm not meaning you now, yeah. but, you know, a, um, an architect. Then come up with, uh, then follow with experience. So where, so really for that first question, what what um, uh, means that I want to? Uh, what shows that I can do this job? Um, or more, what um, what is it that I bring to this project? What I bring to this project? So in this case, it's interest in mm. engaging communities and uh, building better buildings for them. Then what shows that I can do this job? So then you're following up with experience uh, and the places you've worked and what you've done. And then um, what else is relevant uh, or what else helps you see that I can do this job? So yeah. qualifications, other facts. So you're turning it from the specific, which is your interest in the project, to what you... Uh, and then backing it up with things that just give you cred credibility. Right. And that can work a lot better than starting with qualifications. And does it, does, um, does it help to put personal things in here or sort of memorable stories about oh, you, you can, or, I think bios should keep, keep them so keep them pretty short yeah um, I mean you yeah generally I'm, I would always say yes if there's a little story but um, you know you might find another way of adding that in in a blog post or you know do mm -hmm. something like that I think bios uh, you know 50 to 100 words is generally enough brilliant that's absolutely absolutely fascinating that's a real kind of whirlwind there of uh of different topics and different elements that architects need to engage with with their writing yeah. so yeah. how if someone wants to work with you what's the best way for them to get in contact um so i have a website at archetypal.co.uk yep. and archetypal is a-r-c-h-i-t-y-p-a-l.co.uk brilliant um and there i've got a contact form and you can get in touch with me um and yes i'm always up for uh, working you know, working with people who want to find a better way of talking about what they do. Um, and when I say talking, actually, a lot of it is about talking, because I think if you start to be able to talk about what you do, um, at that point, you'll then know how to write about what you do. Yes. Um, so it is, uh, and a lot of, in our workshops we do, there's a lot of talking, because that is actually how you get to the nub of it, and then you, you've got the ideas and you're ready to write. So yeah, talking and writing about what you do, Brilliant. that's what I do. No, that's yeah. amazing. That, that's what I've really taken away from this is that conversational, natural element um, to have yeah. that clear. And that's a very, that makes very compelling words for architects. Thank you. Good. A pleasure. Cheers. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. 
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.